it is not just a country marked on the world map. It is an ancient repository of knowledge, wisdom, and traditions that have withstood the test of time. From the earliest origins of human society to the present, India has played a profound role in shaping not only its own history, but the cultural and spiritual evolution of humanity itself. India, often referred to as Bharat, has been home to a civilization that dates back over five millennia. Today, vibrant patches of color emerge from satellite imagery, revealing the ancient landscapes where the illustrious Harappa and Mohenjo-daro cultures once thrived showcasing sophisticated urban planning, architecture, and trade. But beyond its material accomplishments, India's true greatness lies in its intellectual and spiritual legacy. The country's philosophical explorations and scientific pursuits have enriched human thought for thousands of years. India has been, in every sense, a cradle of time. The pinnacle of India's intellectual and spiritual contributions lies in its most ancient texts, the Vedas. These are not just religious scriptures, they are compendiums of wisdom, metaphysical thought, and spiritual insight that have guided generations of seekers on the path of truth. The word Veda means knowledge or wisdom, and these texts are among the oldest known in human history, dating back over 3,000 years. The four Vedas, Rig Veda, Sam Veda, Yajur Veda, and Atharva Veda were not composed by a single individual or in one particular time period. They were cognized by seers known as Rishis, who in deep meditative states perceived the eternal truths of the universe and expressed them in form of hymns and verses. It is important to understand that the Vedas are not just theological doctrines. They encompass a vast range of subjects, cosmology, ethics, politics, and rituals, as well as deep philosophical inquiries into the nature of reality, existence, and the self. The Vedas, focusing on knowledge, ethical living, and reverence for nature, helped create a society that valued wisdom, art, and spirituality, which continues to influence India's vibrant culture today offering its own unique tapestry of traditions, art, and history. Among the many jewels in India's crown, the state of Rajasthan stands out as a particularly vibrant and colorful representation of the country's rich heritage. And the quest to understand her ancient wisdom takes us on a profound journey across India's varied landscapes, from the majestic, snow-covered Himalayas in the east to the golden deserts of Rajasthan in the west. These sacred lands perhaps once echoed to the sound of the Vedas, hold a timeless connection to ancient wisdom, traveling by train through lush forests, river plains, and rugged hills. Each changing landscape mirrors the depth of spiritual discovery. The train's rhythmic passage echoes the continuous search for truth as the Vedas principles born in these very lands unfold through nature, mind, and soul in perfect harmony. As the land of kings or Rajputana. Rajasthan is a region where centuries old customs and traditions continue to thrive in the modern era. Its culture, architecture, art, and festivals offer a glimpse into a bygone era of grandeur and valor. The cannon stood sentinel, fiercely defending its motherland, spitting death upon its enemies with relentless fury. In the present day, Although the battlefield has changed, its fierce past has faded. Yet, the echoes of the battle it once fought still hover. The warrior ethos of courage and honor 
still lingers in the air. Made from the very golden soil of Rajasthan was Savai Raja Jai Singh II, a visionary ruler of Amir and the favorite of Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. Recognizing his sharp intellect, Aurangzeb bestowed upon him the title Savai, meaning one and a quarter, signifying his superior wisdom. Born on the same day as Emperor Aurangzeb, perhaps their intellects were mirrored by destiny itself, a cosmic coincidence, acknowledging Jai Singh's sharpened brilliance as a reflection of his own, an exemplified military genius through innovative strategies. For instance, he armed his infantry with matchlocks instead of traditional Rajput swords and shields, showcasing his foresight in adapting to changing combat dynamics. Additionally, his development of Jaiwana, the largest wheeled cannon, few examples, illustrating his pioneering spirit. Navigating one of the most tumultuous periods in Indian history with his remarkable military skills, he maneuvered through the complex political landscapes of 18th century India. He skillfully balanced relations with both the Mughal Empire and the rising Marathas. His astute political maneuvers helped expand his influence beyond Rajasthan as his combination of battlefield prowess and political acumen made him one of the most formidable leaders of his time. Savai Raja Jai Singh II was not only a brilliant visionary ruler adept in strategy and tactics, who navigates both battlefield and political arenas with masterful precision, but was also a patron of science and architecture. In 1727, as a response to both practical and visionary needs, Maharaja Jai Singh sought to create a well-planned, scientifically designed city that would reflect the principles of Vastu Shastra or Vedic architecture and modern knowledge. He collaborated with renowned architect Vidyadhar Bhattacharya to design Jaipur in a grid pattern, making it one of the earliest planned cities in India. Jaipur's city layout reflects elements of Harappa and Mohanjo-daro's planning with its grid system and strategic water management. Though not so geographically far from these ancient sites, Jaipur blends modern urban design with ancient architectural principles. The city's wide streets, organized layout, and stunning architecture were meant to blend practicality with aesthetical beauty. Ensuring Jaipur's place as a cultural and intellectual center, he also wanted a strategically located city that could serve as a hub for trade, as Jaipur lay on key trade routes. Thus, the construction of Jaipur reflected his foresight as a ruler, balancing political, economic, and cultural aspirations for his kingdom. Today, Jaipur is a beautiful fusion of the past and present, preserving its medieval charm while evolving into a modern city. Its majestic forts, rich traditions and colorful culture draw people from across the world, offering a captivating blend of timeless heritage and vibrant 21st century energy. One such testament to human ingenuity is located right beside Jaipur's royal palace, the Jantar Mantar, a remarkable symbol of ancient scientific prowess that has etched an indelible footprint of Rajasthan's golden history upon the timeless fabric of world heritage. Built by Maharaja Jai Singh II, it houses vast astronomical instruments designed for precise celestial observations. The UNESCO World Heritage Site exemplifies a perfect fusion of royal patronage architectural innovation and timeless scientific inquiry. Why do you think is the Yantra so relevant at this point of time? Why should one person care about it? I think there are two things. See, one thing is that we always get brainwashed by this 
education which dominates the world right now, which is dictated by the Deo Christian sort of view of the world, that all major discoveries are made in the West, starting with the Greeks, and then were re enlivened in the time of the Renaissance uh, in the 15th, 16th century, like that. And anything else which is from the East, from India or elsewhere, is not considered to be of any relevance. And this monument here is very big proof that this is simply not the case. Because, well, it has been built that long ago, three years ago, about, but the whole knowledge of it, this yantras is there embedded in the text, in the Vedic text, and which show that they knew a great deal of how the earth moves. They knew everything, basically, very precisely. I mean, it's mind-blowing what you see here, and that should be studied in depth, and everybody will then understand that, first of all, the earth is round and was always round and this is not flat and all the things which goes around again in some people's head because the, these yantas wouldn't work if that would be the case, number one. And number two, it is made with such a precision that you actually are surprised how could they do that. A celebrated tourist destination captivates visitors with its remarkable grandeur and rich history as an astronomical observatory. Its stunning architecture also have been a popular shooting location for many feature films. And perhaps, in a tribute to its elegance and celestial connection, an award-winning Japanese racehorse also bears its name. Jantar Mantar stands as a mysterious mirror to the universe, reflecting humanity's enduring fascination with the stars and our quest for understanding the cosmos. Built in the early decades of 18th century, consists of five observatories across India, located in Delhi, Jaipur, Ujjain, Mathura, and Varanasi, each featuring a unique set of astronomical instruments designed for observing celestial bodies and performing various calculations related to time and astronomy. Also, the construction of multiple Jantar Mantar observatories underscores their astronomical significance and highlights the influential role of Maharaja Jai Singh within the Mughal Empire. His passion for astronomy and commitment to scientific advancement reflect the cultural exchange and intellectual pursuits of the era. These observatories not only facilitated accurate celestial observations, but also symbolized the merging of indigenous knowledge with Mughal patronage. Showcasing Maharaja Jai Singh's dedication to promoting learning and fostering a rich scientific legacy in India. As we know, the Vedic knowledge is all gained from within, and that are the levels which we know from the text also. It's at the Bekrivani, Bekrivani, which is clearly described in the in the Shiksha, how this comes about, this where we speak and we communicate with each other. Then it's the next final level, which is Madhyabani, which is what you could most compare to a level of telepathy or even to communicate with animals and other beings, kind of. And then comes the next level, and then that's when it starts to become interesting. That is Pashyantvani. You know, Pashyant comes from the root Trishti, and it gets it hard to adhesh in Sanskrit, so to say, but you would say in English, an irregular verb that becomes from Trishti to Prashya. And that means you see that Pashyant level, and that is the level where you get all this information of the universe, the mathematics of it, the Jyotish, all the things is on that level. So that's the, on that level, all the Rishis had the access to knowledge. And Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras also, he says, Ritam Paratatra Pragya, that means on the level of the, where we do the process of rhythm, where we do the samnema, then we get the pragya, and the pragya is the knowledge from within. So, and 
but the other is that's very clear. That is the knowledge and the rest you can draw in the wastebasket. I mean, whatever you are learning from the center. So it's, it is, it is very superficial. So the real knowledge is what they get from within. And that's where all the knowledge has come from. So it was the sages of India, sages of this area of the world. I wouldn't like to say India because it was, India was at that time much bigger than what it is today. But it's the sages of the, the, it's the scientists of that time were sages, were saints. And that's how they were experiencing all this. Now the most, most refined level is the para level. That's where you can even hear the bait. It says, you took out, come with the karma and they, whoever is awake, him the richer seek out. So that is the most refined level, is that parallel. Maishi speaks about this very clearly, that that is real Vedic science. So it's not that they have got any knowledge through all this thing. It is because they had the knowledge that they could build with this rich history in mind, let's explore the remarkable yantras of Jantamantar. So without further ado, let's get to know the yantras. So right now we are standing next to this big dial type of an instrument. This is known as Yantra Raj. And as you can see here, that this Yantra Raj has various kinds of divisions on it. Basically, it's divided into 60 ghatis and for starters, one ghati is equal to six degrees or in other words, 24 minutes. And this big dial has important markings on them. Say for example, of various nakshatras and constellations and etc. So this is used for determining the altitude of heavenly bodies and objects alike, like stars for instance. And how is this done is, a tube is mounted to the center, like you see here, and a cert any certain object in the sky, or a st say for instance a star, is fixed on in the frame of the tube, and then the corresponding reading on the dial is noted, thus giving the position of these coordinates of the star in the heaven. To the left of this dial, you see another big dial here. So now that dial was basically used for noting down the readings observed from this dial to its right. So basically this dial was is used for janta, which is observation. And that dial is done for mantar, which is calculation. So behind me are two Stonehenge kind of cylindrical instruments, which are collectively known as Ram Yantra. So this is a very simple instrument in the sense that it is used for measuring the horizontal coordinate. So what is a horizontal coordinate? It consists of altitude and azimuth. As we know, the altitude is the height that the sun makes in relation to the horizon. And azimuth is the angle it makes in relation to the North Pole, which is conventionally marked as zero. So as you can notice behind me, the two yantras are complementary to each other, which means the segment which is empty in one yantra is filled by the complementary segment in the other yantra. So as you can notice, two yantras behind me consist altogether of 24 segments. So the one yantra consists of 12 segments and the other yantra also consists of 12 segments. But here's the catch that one of the yantras, as you can see or to my left, has broader walls than the instrument you see to my right. This precisely because the one to my left has 18 degree segments each, you know, and the one to my right, the wall comprises of 12 degree segment each. So as we know that the earth rotates four degrees every minute, so 18 degree segment translates into 72 minutes for the yantra on my left, which is roughly, or which is exactly equal to 
three ghatis and as we know one ghati is 24 minutes which is a vedic unit of time division and the one to my right which comprises of segment of 12 degree each and as we know if we do the maths again we notice that earth it comes down to 48 minutes 12 degree into 4 minutes and which means it's equal to two ghatis each so what does this mean that the stunts says in any one segment the shadow of the center pole or the nomen which casts the shadows on the inner cylindrical walls which is used for making the altitude and azimuth measurement the shadow stays in the yantra to my east on this inner cylindrical walls for 72 minutes and on my right the same shadow cast by the nomen at the center of the yantra stays on a segment for 48 minutes so let's go ahead and <laughs> to be more precise let's go behind <laughs> and have a closer look at the yantras and calculate the readings for ourselves so behind me is the part a of the ram yantra and let's go inside and see it in action so right now we are standing inside the part a of the ram yantra and as you can see here the nomen of this yantra is casting its shadow on the inner walls of this cylindrical chamber and as we can see here the walls of this cylindrical chamber are 18 degree thick which means that there are 18 blocks on this chamber comprising of 1 1 degree each block so let's go ahead and take the azimuth and the altitude reading of the sun so how do we take the azimuth and the altitude reading you see the markings indicated towards the left of the wall written in the devanagari script indicates the altitude of the sun and the markings on the outer periphery of the cylindrical wall indicates the azimuth of the sun let's go ahead and measure the altitude and azimuth of the sun here we see that it's 45 degrees we go gradually up it's 40 degrees it's 35 degrees it's 30 degrees it's 25 degrees it's 20 degrees then you have 19 degree 18 degree so right now if you can see here the tip of the nomen is halfway between 18 and 19 degrees which means right now the altitude of the sun is as the shadow recedes as we go as the time progresses as the length of the shadow decreases right now the altitude of the sun is 18 degree 30 minutes Now, in order to take the azimuth of the sun, I use the tip of the nomen as the reference, and move all the way, the center of the tip of the nomen, to be more precise, as a reference, and go all the way up, and reach the outer circular edge of this building, and I see the reading corresponding to it. So I see that one and a half blocks before it's written two eighty, although the number two is not clear, which means. The azimuth of the sun right now in Jaipur is 280 degrees and plus one and a half degrees, which stands out to 281.5 degrees. What does this mean? It means that the Earth, since the solar noon in Jaipur yesterday, has rotated about 281.5 degrees, and it still has an additional, let's say. 78.5 degree to complete its full rotation and as the day progresses the length of the shadow starts to decrease as the sun approaches the meridian and not only that the shadow being projected by the nomen starts to shift in this direction as you can see here and slowly enters the void the complementary segment of the yantra during which we will have to go to the part b of the yantra to make take the measurement so now let's go all the way here and finally we realize that at 12 o'clock noon the shadow will be cast here so finally as the earth completes its 360 degree rotation about its axis we would see the shadow of the nomen being cast on this triangular slag that we see here corresponding to the zeroth marking azimuthal marking on this circumference of this wall
Right now we are going to measure the altitude of the sun at solar noon during four key times of the year. During the two equinoxes, that is the autumn and the vernal equinox, and during the summer and winter solstice. So as we know, the latitude of the Jaipur is 27 degrees, so which is three and a half degrees above the Tropic of Cancer belt, or the Tropic of Cancer line. So this means that the sun will never cross the zenith of the observer to which this gnomon, as we see here, was pointing at. So, there's a difference of three and a half degrees between the latitude of the Jaipur and the latitude of Tropic of Cancer on the celestial hemisphere. So, we can see that each segment, each segment of this triangular slab that you see here comprises of one degree. And since the latitude of Jaipur is three and a half degrees, so the Tropic of Cancer marking will lie three and a half degrees away from the zenith. So one, two, three, and three and a half. So this corresponds to 85, 86, 86 and a half degrees. 86 and a half degrees. So what would be the altitude of the sun or when it crosses the meridian during the summer solstice, it would be 86 and a half degrees. So let's go ahead further and see what happens during the equinox. So we are going down and down and down and down. Finally, we reach this point, two degrees before the 65 degree inscription in Devanagari on this triangular slab. Say, where is this peak pointing to? 63 degrees. What does this mean that the altitude of the sun during the solar noon at equinox, both the equinoxes will be 23. This will be 63 degrees. Why 63 degrees? Because at 63 degrees, when the sun crosses the equator during the equinox, the 63 degree point is exactly 27 degrees away from the latitude of the Jaipur. So, during the equinox, if I were to come here and look at the shadow cast by the moment, I would notice that the tip of the shadow would exactly lie on the slab, the sides of the slab, as the Earth completes its 360 degree rotation, indicating the solar noon, at the point when the sun exactly crosses the meridian during the equinox. Now we go ahead further and see what happens during the winter solstice, which lies 23 and a half degrees below the celestial equator. Finally, we have reached 23. This slab indicates the 23rd, 23. Here we are, 24th slab. And as we know, each slab corresponds to each segment of this, each segment or each square segment corresponds to one degree. And as we go up the slab and we have finally reached this 23 and a half segment that we see here. So, what this means is that during the winter solstice, the altitude of the sun would be one and a half degrees short of this. 40 degree inscription which is written here which translates to 38 and a half so the altitude of the sun when it crosses the meridian at solar noon during the winter solstice would be 38 and a half degree so what this means what this means is that the length of the shadow during the solar noon would be the highest as the tip of the gnomon would be here and the length of the shadow during the solar noon at summer solstice would be the lowest as we saw earlier and the length of the shadow as oscillates between these two points as the sun goes through its Uttarayan and Dakshinayan. So we are standing in front of the part B of the Ram Yantra and as you can see the walls of the part B of the Ram Yantra are complementary to the part A of the Ram Yantra. Thus conjoined they mark a 30 degree segment. Ram Yantra part A being 18 degree segment as we saw earlier and the Ram Yantra part B being 
12 degree segment as we are going to see in a short while as the sun progresses as the earth revolves as the earth rotates and the sun moves from east to west the shadows alternate between these two yantra the shadow stays on the part a of the yantra for 72 minutes and part b of the yantra for 48 minutes so let's go inside and have a deeper look at this yantra so right now we are in the part b of the ram yantra and let's see the altitude and azimuth of the sun at this point of time to see the contrast between the two yantras and now as we can see here that the walls of this yantra comprises of squares of a degree each and there are 12 such squares that you can see as i move my laser pointer from left to right 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 now if you remember the walls of the part a of the ram yantra had 18 such squares whereas here we have 12 such squares indicating the fact that this yantra measures the rotation of the earth corresponding to every 12 degrees of its rotation whereas that measures it up to 18 degrees and put together like we said before they measure alternatively between these two and add up to 30 degree of continuous measurement in a period of 2 hours so let's measure the altitude and azimuth so let's try measuring the altitude of the sun at this moment as you can see that the pigeon is sitting right on top of the nomen and which we can see on the shadow being projected on the wall so i go by the tip of the nomen and go all the way side and i measure the altitude of the sun or as we had mentioned earlier each square slab here indicates 1 degree and let's go a bit below so how many degrees does this adds up to so let's go down a little so we know that this is 45 degree slab here means 45 degrees so as we go up 45 44 43 42 41 40 39 38 37 36 35 34 33 so as we can see we are close to 32 degrees so which means that the altitude of the sun right now is 32 degrees and perhaps 30 minutes in order to measure azimuth we use a reference point and we can see here that this line that we see here traces its way all the way up to to 90 written in devanagari above on the circle edge of the circumference point on the circumference of the bigger cylinder and but obviously we can see that it's too tedious to measure the azimuth in that manner so what do we do is we use that reference point in the triangular slab which is shown here and as we saw this was 290 degrees so it's 291 292 and we can see that the center of the nomen falls sh nomen's shadow falls somewhere in between this so it will be 291.5 degrees which will be the azimuth of the sun or in other words the degrees that are that the earth has rotated since the solar noon yesterday So right now we are standing next to Digam Shantra. Dig in Sanskrit means direction, and this instrument is used for measuring the azimuth angle of heavenly body. In this case, it's primarily the sun. And as we can see, where my finger points to, that zero indication that represents the north of this instrument, and that is precisely the north-south meridian. If we draw a straight line from there, why is it at the north? it's precisely because when the sun is at the south and and since this instrument is a reflection of the events happening in the sky you see that the zeroth marking is on the northern side of the instrument so how does this instrument work so 
like we had discussed earlier in the case of ram yantra azimuth is used for measuring the degree of rotation the the earth has completed since the solar noon and as the sun approaches the meridian we can notice that although it, this instrument that we are pointing at right here is not operational for some reason but if we use our imagination a little bit the shadow casts on the inner cylindrical walls which we will look at when we go inside would shift 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 and finally correspond to the zeroth marking that we see here marking the completion of a 360 degree rotation of the earth so let's go inside this yantra and have a closer look at the readings and calibration of this is so right now we are standing inside the digam yantra and as you can see that there's no nomen or any ring to cast any shadow on these cylindrical walls to take any azimuthal measurements so here we have to play with our imagination a little bit and if we imagine a ring like structure suspended in about this inner cylindrical wall just like in the jay prakash yantra we would notice that the shadow of that ring would fall on this inner periphery or this inner cylindrical structure and you see that pin over there that pin is used for connecting a rope a rope is basically mounted on that pin and it is moved along this wall the next of which i'm standing the rope is basically moved along this wall and it is made to align with the center of the ring or the nomen which casts the shadow on these inner walls and then the reading corresponding to the overlapping between the rope and the center of the nomen on the marble slab that we see here is used to indicate the azimuth angle of the sun so right now we are standing in front of another magnificent yantra and this yantra is lagu samrat yantra or the smaller version of the equatorial sundial and if you look to the east of this yantra you will see the brihat samrat yantra or the bigger version of this sundial so how this yantra works let's have a close look at its construction details so basically this yantra comprises of a wedge the hypotenuse of which is pointing exactly to the north celestial pole and if you notice that there are two wing like structures attached to this wedge what are these wing like structures they are basically marble quadrants which have the markings of the time on them and they are mounted parallel to the equat they are mounted on the equatorial plane so basically this yantra is used to measure the equatorial coordinates of the celestial object in the sky so how does this work as the sun rises in the east it starts casting its shadow on the western half of the or the western quadrant of this yantra as we can see right there and as the time progresses we notice that the shadow gradually starts shifting downward 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 and finally at the meridian there will not be any shadow for 20 seconds why 20 seconds because 20 seconds is the accuracy of this instrument and at post 20 seconds you will again start noticing shadow on the eastern half of this instrument as the sun starts descending the meridian and back towards the western horizon and another key factor to mention here is that if you notice the hypotenuse of this wedge it casts an angle the angle it makes with the horizon corresponds to the latitude of this place which is equal to 26.9 degrees as you might have heard <laughs> so often so let's go and take a closer look at how this yantra works in order to get a better picture of its working so how this works is that we can see that the main segment you can see here written in devanagari 10 and here you can see 11 so the main segment is comprises of an r and each r segment is further subdivided into four mini segments of 15 minutes each and each 15 minute segment is further subdivided into 15 one minute segments as we can see here and each 1 minute segment is further subdivided into 3 mini segments of 20 seconds each 
So what is the time right now at Jaipur? As we, if you recollect, it's 10, 15, 30, 35, 36, 37, 38. So what is the local time correction we need to add to 1038 to get the Indian standard time? It is 1038 plus 18, which comes to 1056. So Indian standard time right now is 1056. So as we notice the shadow gradually shifts, shifts, shifts and starts to move towards the 12 o'clock segment. That is as the sun starts moving towards the meridian, we will reach this brief interval corresponding to the accuracy of this instrument, in this case being 20 seconds, where the sun's shadow will not be visible on either of the quadrants, the one on the west where we are sitting right now and on the east, which is to the other side. But after that 20 seconds, the eastern part of the yantra or the eastern marble quadrant again kicks into action. So thereby giving us the time readings. Indian Standard Time set at UTC plus 530 and anchored to the 82.5 degree East Meridian serves as a unified temporal benchmark for the country. However, as Earth winds its elliptical path around the sun, coupled with the gentle inclination of its axis, regions like Jaipur witness subtle shifts in local solar noon throughout the year. This delicate interplay between a fixed standard time and variable solar time begets what is known as the equation of time, introducing nuanced local time corrections that reflect Earth's celestial rhythms. However, in essence, solar declination is one of the variables affecting the equation of time by changing the sun's position in the sky, which in turn contributes to the shifting solar noon across the year. Right now we are standing on the Isle of Samrat Yantra. And why are we standing here? To explore another feature of this instrument. What feature? It is the feature of measuring the declination angle of a celestial object in the sky. Today we'll be measuring the declination angle of the sun and how it is done. As we can see, there's a set of readings, dark readings marked on the marble slab, which is being indicated by the laser pointer here. We're going to use those readings to check the declination angle of the sun. So let's go closer and Explore this a little. So right now we are having a closer look at the scale which is used for determining the declination angle of the sun. As you can see, the scale extends all the way from 0, 10 to 20 degrees. And each segment of the scale comprises of 1 degree, which is divided into 6 segments, which translates into 10 arc minutes of mini segments each mini segment each. So let's go and see how we measure the declination angle of the sun using this using this scale. So first I keep my finger pointed on the zeroth reading of the scale and I can see the shadow being projected although it's not too sharp but I can still see the shadow being projected on the western marble western wing of this yantra or the marble quadrant and then I slowly move my fingers backward, 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 backward up to the point where the shadow just ceases to appear on the marble quadrant. That is, the shadow has now shifted and it has moved past the outer edge. So what is the reading I'm getting will be the, the degrees that my hand has moved and the reading corresponding to that here would help me measure the declination angle of the sun. So how many degrees my hand has moved so far? It's close to two degrees from the zeroth reading of the scale. So which means that the declination angle of the sun at 26th of September is close to two degrees. So with this, we wrap up with this wrap up with this instrument and go ahead to the next one. Right now, we are standing in front of the Brihat Samrat Yantra, or to be translated in English, it's the bigger version of the equatorial sundial. So as we can, as we had discussed before, the Lagu Samrat Yantra, 
the structure is very similar and you can see the persian influence stand right on top of the wedge as you can see the persian type of a dome which is uh, an islamic influence on this uh, marvelous architecture as we can see there's a miniature model present right here which might help us explain this much better so we see that the concept is basically the same as in the lagu samrat yantra and you see that the hypotenuse makes an angle of 27 degrees which is equivalent to the latitude of this place and you see a miniature version of this yantra doing the same thing and you see the marble quadrants or in this case not marble exactly as it was in the lagu samrat yantra but rather the quadrants you see here are mounted on the equatorial plane and the top of the hypotenuse which is being indicated there points to the not celestial pole now what is the basic difference between the lagu samrat yantra and this brihat samrat yantra lies mainly in terms of the precision whereas the lagu samrat yantra gives us a precision of 20 seconds which is its least count this bigger version of the same yantra here gives us a precision up to 2 seconds which is indeed amazing considering the fact that the entire thing is built on has a the entire thing is built on stone and to have that kind of a precision is indeed marvelous so the readings on the quadrants are similar to that of the lagu samrat yantra and as we can see the sun has moved towards the west so the eastern quadrant of the brihat samrat yantra is what we will be using for measuring the local time of jaipur so let's go ahead and now we are standing on the western segment of the brihat samrat yantra and as we can see the sun is not casting its shadow on the western marble quadrant or in other words the nomen is not casting its shadow on the western quadrant the reason why it is not doing so is precisely because the sun has crossed the meridian and has moved into the west which means in order to get the local time of jaipur we will have to head towards the eastern segment of the yantra and another beautiful use that the pandits and the astrologers made of this yantra in the past was they used to climb these steps that we can see here and head into that persian dome and mount a flag there and check the wind direction and use that as one of the data for predicting the climate of this region and another beautiful observation one can make from here is that if one were to go into that dome and observe the polaris and the ursa minor one would see that rotating throughout the year about the polaris that is if one were to go there say at 8 pm at summer solstice at winter solstice and two equinox they would note that the position of the ursa minor is not the same indicating the circumpolar movement of the constellation so now we are on the eastern segment of the brihat samrat yantra and as we can see that this part of the yantra becomes operational from 12 noon to 6 pm when the sun crosses the meridian and is heading towards the west so now you guys might be wondering now you might be wondering why have i kept my hand like this but if just look right behind this hand and you will notice the shadow that is being cast by the nomen on the marble quadrant so that shadow the point at which it crosses the readings indicated the point at which it crosses the readings indicated on the marble it shows the local time of the jaipur and as we can see or we can we could extrapolate that figure over time we could see the shadow slowly moving upward upward as sun further descends into the horizon and finally when it is right about near to its setting phase one can see the shadow going up right all the way up the eastern quadrant so let's go and have a closer look at the reading so right now we are standing at the eastern segment or the eastern wing of the brihat samrat yantra and let's have a closer look at its calibrations so let's start from the devanagari symbol 3 here which indicates 3 o'clock and find out the local time of jaipur 
So we start from three, it's three one, three two, three three, three four, three five, three six, three seven, three eight, three nine, three ten, three eleven, three twelve, three thirteen, three fourteen, three fifteen. You can notice that the line indicating the fifteenth minute sticks out like an odd one out from the rest around it. So three fifteen, three sixteen, three seventeen, three eighteen, three nineteen, three twenty, three twenty one, three twenty two, three twenty three. So the local time of Jaipur right now is 3.23 followed by 1, 2, 3.23 and 12 seconds. So add 18 minutes to it, you get 3.41, 18 seconds. That's the Indian standard time. So now let's have a closer look at the divisions. So let's take a 15 segment division here as indicated out, which is denoted by this line sticking out. So this 15 se this segment, this 15 minute segment is divided into 15 sections of one minute each. And if I have a closer look at the one minute segment, as you can see here, if I have a closer look at the one minute segment here, it is further subdivided into 10 segments. So if we get our maths right, that translates to six second division, which corresponds to each subdivision here. Now each six second segment is further subdivided into three segments, which is a bit hard to see, but if you notice closely, you can have a nice view of it. So each segment of the smallest division comprises of six divided by three, which is two seconds. So which indicates the least count of this instrument or the accuracy level of this instrument. Now, if we remember the Lagu Samrat Yantra had an accuracy of 20 seconds, while this sam Brihat Samrat Yantra has an accuracy of 2 seconds. Now, if we rewind the clock a little bit and go back in time, we would notice that when the sun crosses the meridian and is about to head towards the west in this direction, we would notice that when the sun is exactly on the meridian, both wings of this Yantra ceases to function. In other words, the Noman doesn't cast shadow on both sides of the yantra. Why is this so? Because sun is exactly on top of the meridian and hence there is no shadow cast by the gnomon on either sides. How long is it gonna not function? It depends on the least count of the instrument. For Lagu Samrat Yantra, when the sun crosses the meridian, when the sun crosses the meridian, the instrument ceases to function for 20 seconds. Whereas for this yantra, the instrument ceases to function for two seconds. Amazing, isn't it? And if we go a bit ahead in time, we'll notice that this shadow, which is caused by this gnomon out here, which, ex which points to the North Celestial Pole, this shadow caused by the gnomon moves up, 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 and finally extends into the last segment corresponding to 6 p.m. when the sun is just about to set. So with this, we wrap up with this instrument and bid a note to this instrument. Right now we are standing in front of the Nadi Velai Yantra or the Hemispherical Sundial. We are currently at the Uttar Gola segment of this Yantra. And as we can see, the axis of this Yantra is parallel to the nomen of the Brihat Samrat Yantra on the east and the Lagu Samrat Yantra on the west. What this means is that the axis of this Yantra is pointing at the North Celestial Pole. And this big dial that we see here, this 24 segmented dial is mounted on a plane which is parallel to the equator. What is the purpose of this Yantra? This Yantra is used for finding the hour angle of the sun, the declination, time of the day, as well as the fact that the sun, is, whether the sun is in the northern or the southern half of the celestial hemisphere. How this yantra works, let's have a closer look. Now we can see that this bigger dial here is divided into 24 hour segment and each hour segment is divided into 12 minor segments of five minutes each. And each five minute segment is further subdivided into even smaller segment of one one minute each. What this means? 
is that the accuracy of this instrument comes down to one minute. And now we must remember that during the course of a year, the sun goes its takes as the sun undergoes its ecliptic journey, it stays in the northern celestial hemisphere for six months and it stays in the southern celestial hemisphere for six months. And as we just cross the autumn equinox, we notice that despite the presence of the sun in our east and despite this bright sunny day we are having right now, that the nomen of this instrument is not casting any shadow corresponding to the time, the local area time. Why is it so? It's precisely because the southern part of this instrument is in action. So let's go and check out the southern part of this instrument. So after having gone in detail about the northern segment of this yantra, we are here in the southern half segment of this yantra. And as we can see that this yantra has a further subdivision, which divides a day into 60 ghatis. Now this is a Vedic time division. Each ghati we can see, ghati we can see here, comprises of 24 minutes. So making, if you do the math, if you get our maths right, a day consists of 1440 minutes. So if you divide it by 24 ghatis, or which is one ghati, if you divide it by 24, how many ghatis we get? We get 60, which is precisely what is reflected here. So this is an additional time division which you see in this yantra. And now if we were to check the local time, we must always remember that all these yantras give the local time of this, which de entirely depends on the place of, in which we are taking the measurement. So we are right now located in Jaipur, which is about 27 degrees latitude, as you might have heard so many times. So <laughs> here we are. So let us check the local time of Jaipur using this yantra. So as we can see, the local time right now, if you can see the pin head, shadow of cast by the pin, it corresponds to 919. So the local time right now is 919. So as we saw that the local time displayed by this, by the southern half of this dial is 9. 19 a.m. or 9.20 a.m. which corresponds to after adding 18 minutes which corresponds to 9.20 plus 18 which is 9.38 which is the Indian standard time the time which we see on our clocks so another beautiful part of this instrument is that it can also be used to measure the declination so we being right here at the equinox if you look at the length of the shadow We can see the shadow being cast all the way till here. But as the sun progresses away from the celestial equator towards the Capricorn or towards the winter solstice, we will notice the length of the shadow ke keeps getting shorter. So the sh length of the shadow will oscillate from here, which is the equinox time, to all the way gradually decreasing, decreasing. Finally, at the winter solstice, if I were to check, the same time, if I were to check, if I were to be in this place at the same time, the length of the shadow would be this much. So using this, we can also measure the declination of the sun. And our angle, as we see, is precisely, can be precisely measured using the Gati division or the main segment division, as we can see here. And moreover, this instrument can also function in the moonlight and now that would entirely depend on the brightness of the moon and the shadow that it ca casts using the spin on this dial. So I would say that we would be able to get a good reading on the upper half of this division, which is from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. when the moon is bright, which would be ideally from the, let's say, the... Ashtami of Krishna, Ashtami of Shukla Paksh to Ashtami of Krishna Paksh, when the moon is usually bright. We can also get the readings. And another extrapolation of this inference is that whatever planets we, which are very close to the moon, we can clearly see using the shadow that whether the moon or the planet lies in the northern half of the celestial hemisphere or on the southern half of the celestial hemisphere.
So the Nadivalaya Yantra has an additional Vedic aspect. Marishiji added to every Yantra that Vedic influence. Now, in, as the name suggests, Nadi, it has something to do with the reading of the Nadi also. And that, by watching on the Vedic Observatory, this particular Yantra, it will shield off, it will offset the influences from outside and gives a more accurate reading of a patient's pulse by an accomplished idea. So that being said, we, it's time to wrap up with this beautiful Yantra. So right now we are looking at two, one of the most versatile Yantras in Jantar Mantar, and which is now, in this case, being Chakra Yantra. So as we can see, the Chakra Yantra constitutes of two dials, one a bigger dial, as is quite visible here, and a smaller dial in the direction that my fingers are pointing. So the smaller dial is divided into 24 ghatis, and the bigger dial is divided into 360 degrees, with each degree further subdivided into 10 divisions of 6 arc minutes each. As we can see here, the pivot of the smaller dial is parallel to the nomen of the Brihat Samrat Yantra, which is located at 12 o'clock to me. So which means that the pivot of this smaller dial is pointing in the north-south direction. And the segment that we see here, this, the segment that we see here, this big diameter of this bigger dial is nothing but the celestial equator. And this angle that we see is the declination angle of Jaipur, or its latitude in other words. It's not fair to use the word declination or angle for Jaipur because Jaipur is not any celestial object per se. But we can see that this is the latitude of Jaipur and this amounts to 27 degrees. So what is the function of this yantra? This yantra is used for determining the declination angle and R angle of any celestial object in the sky, not just the sun. And how is it done? You can see the hole where my fingers are pointing at. A tube is inserted in this hole and this chakra, which is for some reason locked right now, is free to move in this direction as well as in this direction. So when the tube is attached to this center hole and the chakra is tilted so as to bring into the frame of the tube any celestial object that is under the observation, we can use the corresponding readings on the dials to give the declination and R angle. So what does R angle mean for starters? R angle is nothing but the angle between the line passing through the celestial object and the North Pole and the meridian of the observer. So this is known as R angle. And what is declination? Declination is nothing but the angular distance of any celestial object in regard to the North Celestial Pole or South Celestial Pole for that matter. So right now we are standing next to the Dakshino Bitti Yantra. It's also known as Meridional Wall Instrument. As you can see, the meridional wall, indicated by the laser pointer here, is located on the north-south plane. And right now, it's exactly 12.2 local time, which indicates that the sun has just crossed the meridian. And this, can, this is reflected by the shadow cast by the gnomon on the walls of the meridian. So now this instrument, just like the Digam Shantra, was used for measuring the azimuth angle of the sun. This instrument is used for measuring the altitude of the sun or any celestial object for that matter. So the shadow cast by Noman, as you can see here, I extend the projection of the shadow all the way up to the readings represented on this marble. We find that it culminates at the second segment, right of 60 degree, which is written in Devanagari here. So this translates to 60 degrees and 12 arc minutes, which is the present altitude of the sun in Jaipur. To talk about the divisions of the scales of this instrument, mean that each segment of the scale consists of 10 degrees, and each, degree, each 10 degree segment is further subdivided into one one degree segment. 
and each one degree segment is further subdivided into 10 segments of six arc minute each. And if I go a little bit further down, I notice that each six arc minute segment is further subdivided into three segments of two arc minute each, which means that the least count or the accuracy of this instrument is two arc minutes. Isn't it amazing? We were looking at the west facing part of the instrument or the Dakshinobhiti Yantra. Now we'll go ahead and see the east facing part of the instrument. Right now we are next to the east facing wall of the Dakshinobhiti Yantra. As we can see, you have two quadrants which are intersecting at 60 degrees. Now this part of the yantra is in action from the time that the sun rises in the east till the time that it's just about to cross the meridian. Post which the west facing part of the yantra starts rolling into action. So right now we are standing next to the Krantivrit yantra. So for starters, Krantivrit means the ecliptic or the band comprising of 12 zodiacs. So using this instrument, which for some strange reasons have been logged right now. Using this instrument, we can determine the celestial longitude of any heavenly body in the sky. So the markings, the numbers on this wheel that you see here, or the dial, represent the zodiac sign. And this is used for determining how many degrees the sun has penetrated into each zodiac. Now let's head south of this instrument where there is an actual working prototype and see how we use this to take the measurement. So let's have a closer look on the dial and its readings. And we notice that it starts from six. Now mark this that the six is not Virgo or Kanya because the counting actually starts from zero. So the six represents Libra. So first we have Libra six, and then we move to seven, which is Vrishchik. And then we move to eight, or Sagittarius, nine, 10, 11, Pisces, and finally back to the first point of Aries. And then we go to Taurus, or one, and then two, and then three, and then four, or Simha, or Leo, and then five, which is Kanya or Virgo, and finally we come back to the Libra from where we, from where we started. So for starters, Kranti Vrit means ecliptic, and ecliptic is nothing but the 12 zodiac sign, the belt through which the sun transits as it progress as it moves around the earth, as viewed from the earth throughout the year. So this dial which we see here represents the ecliptic or the 12 zodiacs and it is always at an angle of 23 and a half degree with the dial which is located in the backward. So how do we figure out in which zodiac the sun is in and how many degrees the sun has moved in that particular zodiac? We will see right now. So the first process of me measurement involves calibration of this bigger dial, which means that as you can see here, the shadow cast by the bigger dial is circular in shape. It's like a disc. If we look at the ground, it's like the disc. So we'll have to rotate this dial and calibrate it so that it becomes like a straight line. And then we'll see what happens further. So let's begin with the process of calibration of the dial. So as we were talking about the process of calibration, right now we see that the shadow cast by the bigger dial is very thick in its nature, as in it's entirely circular, as one can see, like a circular disc, like more over, like oval in, oval in shape. So now what we do is, we try to make this shadow sharp, as in try to bring this disc into a straight line. So what we do is we rotate this bigger dial. And as you see, when I rotate the bigger dial, the sharpness of the shadow increases. And finally we have, reach the sharpest point of the shadow possible through calibration. Now the next step involves measurement. How do we measure? It's like we insert our fingers in the center of the dial and then we try to insert our fingers in different dials and look at the shadow, the different holes that has been punched 
in the bigger dial so i put my finger let's say here and i notice that my two fingers are not overlapping in the shadow being projected on the ground so i just move my finger a little bit up and i see that it's closer to overlapping and i move it a little more up and now i see that it's almost overlapping and here it is now as i go a bit more further now i notice that both of my fingers are overlapping so i take the corresponding reading above and i notice that it is somewhere beyond 2 degrees which means that sun is in libra right now and it has moved about 2 degrees and let's say sun has moved 2 degrees and an additional 3 quarter of a degree into libra and as we can see this is the six sign or the this represents the number 6 which means that the sun has entered the libra from here on and as we go further and we, as we know very well that this point of time in which we are right now is very closer to equinox see the diametrically opposite point and it marks zero or the first point of aries now to get the actual position of the sun in the sky we will have to subtract the ianums or the 24 degree which is its current value owing to the third motion of the earth which is the wobbling effect of the earth and the precession of its axis around precession of its precession of its axis around the ecliptic pole the yantras each a marvel in stand alone functionality are also ingeniously interconnected to enhance the precision of celestial measurements through seamless integration they transform observational data into remarkably accurate readings reflecting a sophisticated synergy that elevates their individual capabilities into a unified system of astronomical insight aha jo jay prakash yantra hai jay prakash yantra mein hum dekhte hain sayan suri ke hisab se यानी ट्वेंटी थर्ड सेप्टेम्बर को लिब्रा साइन स्टार्ट हो गया और वो हमें लग्न जो बताता है वो होता है दशम लग्न जैसे मान लीजिए सुबह जब सूर्य उदय होगा तो वो हमको बताएगा जो मध्य में लग्न है वो कौन सा है तो दशम लग्न तुला से कौन सा हो गया तुला वृश्चिक धनु मकर कुंभ मीन मेष वृक्ष मिथुन कर्क तो वो पहला कर्क लग्न बताएगा और उसके लगभग दो घंटे के बाद से सिंह लग्न तो वो मध्य लग्न बताता है दोपहर को 12 बजे जब सूर्य मध्य में आएगा मिड हेवन में उस समय वो बताएगा तुला लग्न और ये जो है ये निरियन सूर्य से बताता है जो साढ़े तेईस अंश का अयन होता है अयन का फर्क तो इस कुंडली में हम क्या देखेंगे जब सूर्य उदय हुआ है तो पूरब दिशा में कौन सा लग्न तो अब जैसे मान लीजिए आज हम देखते हैं तुला राशि चल रही है और यहाँ पर ये शेर जो सामने पड़ रही है देखो मैं पॉइंट कर रहा हूँ ये शेर जैसे यहाँ से शुरू हुई ये लाइन इस लाइन को देखो तो सुबह ये शेर वहाँ से स्टार्ट हुई तो जैसे ही ये यहाँ से स्टार्ट हुई यहाँ आप देखो इस लाइन पे ये लिखा हुआ है तुला लग्न राशि वलय तो उस समय तुला लग्न शुरू हो गया अब धीरे धीरे ये शेर उसी लाइन पे ही आगे बढ़ती जा रही है देखो ये यहाँ पहुँची ये क्रॉस हुआ देखो ये क्रॉस बन गया ये क्रॉस वाली लाइन पर ले लो ये वृश्चिक लग्न शुरू हो गया समझ फिर शेड यहाँ से सीधी उसी में आगे चल रही है वो थर्ड क्रॉस यहाँ आ गया अब इस पर देखो ये ऊपर वो आ गया धनु लग्न लिखा हुआ ना तो जैसे ही वो शेड यहाँ पहुँची थी तो धनु लग्न शुरू हो गया अब यहीं से शेड और आगे बढ़ती जा रही है अब जैसे इस जगह पहुँची तो इस लाइन में देखो वो आगे लिखा हुआ है वो देखो ये लग्न का नाम सामने तो ये इस प्रकार जैसे जैसे ये शेड उसी लाइन पर इसी लाइन पर आगे चलती जाएगी जो जो क्रॉस लाइन आती जाएंगी उनसे आपको इस तरफ ये लग्न का पता चलता रहेगा तो यहाँ से हम दशम लग्न देखते हैं और बीच में ये जो सर्किल है नीचे देखो ये जो चक्र बने हुए जीरो दिस इज जीरो वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट नाइन टेन इलेवन ट्वेल्व थर्टीन फोर्टीन फिफ्टीन टॉप टू बॉटम डिवाइडेड इन फिफ्टीन सर्किल्स पंद्रह सर्किल बने हुए एक सर्किल छः डिग्री का अब जैसे ये देखो आप ये यहाँ से आप काउंट कर सकते हैं ये ऊपर टॉप जो है ये जीरो डिग्री है ये एक सर्किल छः डिग्री ये बारह ये अट्ठारह अठारह के बाद यहाँ चौबीस यहाँ तीस ये तैतीस हाफ हो गया ना साढ़े छः 
सर्किल हो रहे हैं यहाँ से यहाँ तक एक सर्किल छः डिग्री का तैतीस डिग्री तो इस समय हम जयपुर में देखेंगे राइट नाउ सन इज थर्टी थ्री डिग्री अब ऑफ द फोराइजन दिस मोमेंट इन जयपुर अब जैसे जैसे सूरज ऐसे नीचे आता रहेगा ये छाया वहाँ से ऊपर चलती जाएगी एक एक सर्किल क्रॉस होते होते छः डिग्री कम होता जाएगा और यहाँ सनसेट हो जाएगा जीरो डिग्री तो इनसे हम जिसे हम कहते हैं एल्टीट्यूड एंगल ऑफ सन वो भी हम यहाँ पता कर लेते हैं एजीमित के लिए सीधी लाइनें यहाँ बनी हुई हैं जयप्रकाश चंद्र में हम अभी चल रहे हैं वहाँ हम इसको और विस्तार से देखेंगे बस इसमें से ये बता दीजिए कि अभी के टाइम में क्या लग रहा है ये आप देख रहे हैं ये लाइन तुला राशि वाली ये जब यहाँ पहुँची थी ये क्रॉस बना देखो ये क्रॉस देखो ये क्रॉस वाली लाइन कौन सी जा रही है ये दिख रही है क्या लिखा हुआ देखो वो देखो कुंभ लग्न राशि वाला समझ गए तो सूर्य वहाँ है तुला राशि में और ये उसकी लग्न की रेखा है कुंभ लग्न इस समय चल रहा है तो यानी इस समय जयपुर में पूर्व दिशा में वहाँ पर कुंभ राशि स्थित है तो आप ऐसे देख सकते हो सूरज अभी वहाँ है तो आप मान लो तुला राशि अभी वहाँ है तुला के आगे वृश्चिक फिर धनु फिर मकर और बिल्कुल नीचे इस समय कुंभ राशि तीस तीस अंश की दूरी से ठीक है आइए अब हम लोग जयप्रकाश चल रहे हैं जयप्रकाश यंत्र दो भागों में विभाजित किया गया है कि इसको अच्छी तरह देखने और समझने के लिए इसकी गणना करने के लिए कैलकुलेशन करने के लिए व्यक्ति इसके अंदर वहाँ नज़दीक जा सके इसलिए इसको दो भागों में विभाजित करके बनाया गया है तो बारी बारी से दोनों भाग काम करते हैं एक घंटा क और एक घंटा ख वन आवर ए एंड वन आवर बी अल्टरनेट फंक्शन बारी बारी से काम करते हैं अब यहाँ देखिए ये बीच में लोहे की प्लेट लटकी हुई है आयरन डिस्क देखिए ये रिंग लटकी हुई है और इसकी छाया देखो अभी वहाँ है सामने नीचे तो जब इस रिंग की छाया यहाँ नीचे गैप में गिरी हुई है तो इस समय वो भाग कार्य कर रहा है उधर आ गया अब यहाँ देखिए आप जयप्रकाश चंद्र में इस समय देखो मैं आपको इंडिकेट कर रहा हूँ ये शेद वहाँ है इस रिंग की बीच वाली रिंग की शेद वहाँ पर है सुबह ये शेद इस तरफ से ऊपर से यहाँ से शुरू हुई सारा दिन उसी लाइन पर इस प्रकार ये चलेगी ये है विश्व रथ रेखा इक्वेटर लाइन साइंस सूर्य के हिसाब से सूरज तेईस सितंबर को इस पे आ जाता है अभी देखो वो सूर्य है सामने वो छाया तेईस सितंबर को शेर इस लाइन पे आई और हर एक दिन थोड़ा थोड़ा आगे बढ़ती हुई बाईस अक्टूबर को यहाँ पहुँच जाएगी वृश्चिक राशि शुरू हो जाएगी फिर ऊपर जाएगी बाईस नवम्बर धनु राशि बाईस दिसंबर वहाँ मकर राशि तो इस समय सूर्य जो है इस कैलेंडर के हिसाब से तुला राशि में है फिर अब इसमें हम लग्न कैसे देखेंगे तो वहाँ देखो आप सामने ये बारह बजे की लाइन है ये लाइन देखो अब ये जो लाइन है ये बारह बजे की है ये मेरेडियन है ये लाइन ये बारह बजे की है तो सही बारह बजे आज सूर्य इस लाइन पे जैसे ही पहुँचा कुछ मिनट पहले ये क्रॉस लाइन जो ऊपर जा रही है यहाँ लिखा हुआ तुला मध्य लग्न तो यहाँ से तुला लग्न शुरू हुआ अब धीरे धीरे छाया आगे बढ़ी अब देखो उसी लाइन में चल रही और वैसे ही ये रेखा ऊपर की ओर जाती दूसरी आ गई इस रेखा पे वहाँ देखो वो लिखा हुआ है वृश्चिक मध्य लग्न तो यहाँ से तुला लग्न हुआ यहाँ से वृश्चिक लग्न शुरू हुआ और यहाँ पहुँच गए अब देखो ये जो लाइन जा रही है इस लाइन पे आगे लिखा हुआ है धनु मध्य लग्न वो लिखा हुआ ये देखो ये लाइन जा रही है दिख गई देखो ये एग्जैक्टली इस समय ये परछाई वहाँ पहुँची है और ये बता रही है इस समय आकाश के बिल्कुल मध्य में यहाँ धनु राशि मौजूद है धनु लग्न अब ये धनु लग्न बता रहा है फिर हमें ये देखना है कि धनु लग्न कितनी देर पहले शुरू हुआ है और इस धनु लग्न की अवधि कितनी होगी हम ये कहते हैं कहने में आता है कि 360 डिग्री 30 डिग्री का एक लग्न 24 घंटे में 12 लग्न बदलते हैं और साधारण तरीके से कह दिया जाता है दो दो घंटे में लग्न बदलता है 
लेकिन ये सब एक्लिप्टिक बना हुआ है तो इसलिए लग्न की अवधि कभी ज़्यादा और कभी कम होती है अंडाकार है समझ गए तो इस वजह से लग्न की अवधि इक्वल नहीं होती तो अब हमारे पास दो चीज़ हैं कि ये यंत्र वर्तमान समय करंट टाइम इस समय ये बता रहा है कि धनु लग्न लाइन पे शेयर आ गई धनु लग्न शुरू हो गया तो पहली चीज़ तो हमें ये जानना है कि क्या धनु लग्न शुरू हो चुका या नहीं कभी कभी ये बीच में जो तार लटकी हुई है देखो ये वायर है ना तो ये तार अगर थोड़ी ढीली होगी या सही स्थिति में नहीं होगी तो ये थोड़ा फर्क पड़ जाएगा क्योंकि ये फिक्स नहीं है तो फिक्स इंस्ट्रूमेंट वो सामने बनाए हैं तो ये जानने के लिए कि धनु लग्न शुरू हो गया या अभी नहीं हुआ हम वहाँ चलेंगे और वहाँ जाके ये भी देखेंगे कि यदि धनु लग्न शुरू हो चुका है तो कितनी देर पहले शुरू हुआ और फिर उसके बाद धनु लग्न किस समय समाप्त हो रहा है मकर लग्न कब शुरू होगा तो जब हम वहाँ ये जान लेंगे कि धनु लग्न इतने मिनट पूर्व शुरू हुआ और इतने समय बाद समाप्त हो जाएगा मकर लग्न शुरू हो जाएगा तो हमें धनु लग्न की एक्चुअल अवधि मिल जाएगी वी कैन फाइंड आउट एक्चुअल ड्यूरेशन ऑफ द सेगीटेरियस असेंडेंट वाट मिनिट्स बिफोर स्टार्टेड एंड टिल वाट टाइम मोर इट इज सेम सेगीटेरियस असेंडेंट एंड वाट टाइम गोइंग टू बी स्टार्ट कैप्रिकॉन असेंडेंट देन वी कैन फाइंड आउट एक्चुअल ड्यूरेशन ऑफ द सेगीटेरियस असेंडेंट ऑल राइट आइए अब आप इस जयप्रकाश यंत्र में थोड़ा इधर देखिए आप ये जो मैं पॉइंट कर रहा हूँ ये विश्वत रेखा है और यहाँ से ये आखिरी लाइन जो है ये मकर रेखा कहलाती है इसकी दूरी विश्वत रेखा से साढ़े तेईस डिग्री दूर है अब नीचे की ओर देखिए विश्वत रेखा से ये अंतिम छोर ये कर्क रेखा कर्क रेखा और ये जो सेंटर देख रहे हैं सेंटर पॉइंट मध्य बिंदु सम्रत लिखा हुआ ये जयपुर है इक्वेटर से सत्ताईस अंश दूर अब आप देखो ये ये जो जगह है जिसे हम भचक्र कहते हैं जिसके अंदर बारह राशियां होती हैं ठीक है ना जो एक सर्किल तो यहाँ से पहली राशि इस जगह इतनी दूर है दूसरी राशि यहाँ और दूसरी राशि से तीसरी राशि की दूरी देखिए आप ये इसमें समझने की चीज़ है 21 मार्च को सूरज यहाँ आएगा तो 21 अप्रैल को पहले महीने में ये छाया यहाँ पहुँच जाएगी इतनी दूर तो ये लगभग साढ़े ग्यारह डिग्री हो गया डिस्टेंस और 21 अप्रैल से 21 मई यहाँ इतना डिस्टेंस रहेगा देखो तो ये लगभग साढ़े नौ डिग्री का हो गया और फिर यहाँ से देखो ये अंतिम जो है ये ये बिल्कुल छोटा हो गया साढ़े तीन डिग्री का डिस्टेंस है तो इसका मतलब पहले महीने 21 मार्च से पहले महीने 21 मार्च से 21 अप्रैल तक इसकी गति इतनी तेज रहती है कि इस पृथ्वी लगभग 11 डिग्री घूम जाती है एक महीने में आगे बढ़ जाती है तीन महीने में साढ़े तेईस डिग्री इसको जाना है और तीन महीने में साढ़े तेईस डिग्री बैक आना है छः महीने उत्तरी गोलार्ध और फिर छः महीने दक्षिणी गोलार्ध तो तीन महीने में दक्षिणी गोलार्ध में विश्वत रेखा से मकर रेखा तक जाना और मकर रेखा से वापस विश्वत रेखा तक आना लेकिन पहले महीने लगभग साढ़े ग्यारह डिग्री ये क्रॉस कर जाएगा इतना फास्ट देखो डिस्टेंस इक्वेटर से यहाँ तक फिर यहाँ से यहाँ ये सेकंड स्टेप और ये थर्ड स्टेप थर्ड मंथ तो ये जो डिस्टेंस इनमें कम और ज़्यादा है वो इसकी स्पीड कैसे चेंज होती है जब जब सूर्य इसके छोर पर आएगा जिसे हम ट्रॉपिक कहते हैं ये इस प्रकार बना हुआ है तो बीच में से ये चपटी हो गई और दोनों सिरों से बिल्कुल छोटी हो गई तो ये सिरे इतने छोटे हो गए एक महीने के और ये हिस्सा इतना बड़ा हो गया एक महीने का तो इसलिए इसको इस ढंग से बनाया अब दूसरी चीज़ आप ये जानना चाहते हैं कि यहाँ से इस समय 
एजीमत एंगल क्या है देखिए ये पूरा जो ये गोलार्ध बना हुआ देखो ये पूरा गोला ये पृथ्वी का जो अपनी धुरी पे एक भ्रमण होता है जिसे हम रोटेशन कहते हैं 360 डिग्री का ये लगभग 24 घंटे का होता है वैसे ये अवधि 23 घंटे 56 मिनट 0.9 सेकंड रहती है पूरे 24 घंटे नहीं होती तो 12 बजे हर दिन सूरज जब मेरेडियन पे होगा मध्यान्ह जिसे हम कहते हैं तो वो शायद इस लाइन पे होगी 12 बजे और 12 बजे के बाद जैसे पृथ्वी पूरब की ओर पश्चिम से टर्न होगी और सूरज पश्चिम की ओर चेंज होता रहेगा पृथ्वी इस प्रकार देखो वेस्ट से ईस्ट की ओर आएगी और सूरज ईस्ट से वेस्ट की ओर चेंज होगा ऐसे तो यहाँ पर ये परछाई दोपहर बारह बजे सेंट्रल लाइन पे आके और यहाँ से इस तरफ धीरे धीरे चेंज होती रहेगी ऐसे और 24 घंटे बाद ये पूरा एक रोटेशन पूरा एक चक्कर लगा के फिर वहीं आ जाएगी तो जैसे इस समय ये परछाई वहाँ है दोपहर बारह बजे ये वहाँ आई ज़ीरो डिग्री हुई और ऊपर देखो ये नंबर लिखे हुए हैं टेन ट्वेंटी थर्टी फोर्टी फिफ्टी सिक्सटी सेवेंटी एटी इस प्रकार छः छः डिग्री की एक ऐसी मुतलाइन है यहाँ जब ये शायद पहुँचेगी तो ये हो जाएगी उस समय नाइन्टी डिग्री नाइन्टी से पहले ये जो लाइन जा रही है देखो यहाँ से नीचे ऊपर ये एट्टी डिग्री के करीब है सेवेंटी फाइव डिग्री तो हम कहेंगे राइट ना उस सन इज सेवेंटी फाइव डिग्री वेस्ट ऑफ द जयपुर यानी मध्यान्ह पश्चात इस समय सूरज लगभग जयपुर से पिचहत्तर अंश पश्चिम की ओर सूरज चेंज हो गया क्योंकि पृथ्वी अपनी धुरी पे एक रोटेशन में इस समय पिचहत्तर अंश घूम चुकी तो हम कहेंगे सूरज यहाँ से पिचहत्तर अंश आगे नजर आ रहा है इसे एजीमुत कहते हैं पास्ट मेरिडियन डिस्टेंस तो अब हम देखने चल रहे हैं कि ये यंत्र अब छाया देखो काफ़ी आगे आ गई इस धनु लग्न वाली लाइन से ये छाया काफ़ी आगे बढ़ गई यहाँ पर थी क्रॉस पे अब यहाँ आ गई तो हम देखने चल रहे हैं कि धनु लग्न कितनी देर पहले शुरू हुआ उसके लिए जो हम इसका लॉन्गिट्यूड एंगल देखते हैं एक बार आप उसी पद्धति को दोबारा देख लो मान लो इस यंत्र पे हम देखते हैं नीचे देखो एक लाइन हो गई दिख गई अब नीचे देखिए आप एक लाइन हो गई ना अब यहाँ देखो ये मेरी फिंगर वहाँ दिख रही है आप और सूर्य इस समय कहाँ है यहाँ से देखो ये ये देखिए ये लाइन जो है ये विश्वत रेखा है तेईस सितंबर को सूरज यहाँ आया अब नीचे की ओर देखिए आप मेरी फिंगर दो फिंगर देखो दोनों में फ़र्क नज़र आ रहा है दोनों फिंगर के बीच में जो डिस्टेंस है अब यहाँ ये इक्वेटर है और सूरज आज यहाँ आ चुका है देखो ये इक्वेटर है और आज सूरज यहाँ आ चुका है इस जगह तो ये जो है ये लाइन ज़ीरो है ये 180 डिग्री हो गया इक्यासी बयासी तिरासी चौरासी पिचासी आज सूरज एक डिग्री लॉन्गिट्यूड एंगल बना रहा है ठीक है तो जो गणना हम 21 मार्च को ज़ीरो अंश से करते हैं एक एक दिन में पृथ्वी एक एक अंश घूमती जाती है जिसे हम कहते हैं रेवुलेशन तो 21 मार्च को ज़ीरो अंश हुआ यहाँ से और तेईस सितम्बर को एक हो गया और आज ये एक डिग्री कंप्लीट कर रहा है तो अब हम वहाँ धनु राशि पे चल के देखेंगे जयप्रकाश यंत्र बता रहा है अभी धनु लग्न तो हम धनु राशि पे देखेंगे कि सूर्य एक डिग्री का एंगल वहाँ कब बना रहा था कितनी देर पहले समझ गया तो हमें ये नोट करके रखना है कापी दीजिए आप कि आज सबसे महत्वपूर्ण चीज़ जो है आज के लिए वो है हमारा सूर्य का लॉन्गिट्यूड एंगल इस एक्लिप्टिक पे 21 मार्च को सूर्य यहाँ आया और 23 सितंबर को यहाँ आया ठीक है और ये हो गया 180 डिग्री और आज सूरज यहाँ आ गया तो अब हम कहेंगे टुडे सन इज़ 185 डिग्री कंप्लीटिंग हियर टुडे राइट नाउ सन इज़ हियर ठीक है एक डिग्री अब आइए आप चलिए धनु पे ये है देखिए धनु राशि और ये इसका सिंबल अब यहाँ देखिए आप इस समय ये शेड यहाँ है और ये नंबर है 180 एट्टी 
और हम वहाँ क्या कैलकुलेट करके आए हैं वन हंड्रेड एटी फाइव तो जिस समय ये शेयर एटी फाइव पे थी ये एटी एटी वन एटी टू एटी थ्री एटी फोर एटी फाइव जिस समय ये शेयर यहाँ पहुँची धनु लग्न शुरू हुआ ठीक है इक्यासी बयासी तिरासी चौरासी पिचासी इस जगह जब ये शेयर इससे पीछे थी तब वृश्चिक लग्न था तो ये कितनी डिग्री आगे बढ़ गई है अभी ज़ीरो वन टू थ्री फोर फोर एंड हाफ साढ़े चार डिग्री ठीक है फोर पॉइंट हाफ प्लस साढ़े चार डिग्री एक डिग्री जो है वो चार मिनट की है ठीक है साढ़े चार डिग्री अट्ठारह डिग्री अट्ठारह मिनट समझे अट्ठारह मिनट पहले वृश्चिक लग्न था अब 18 मिनट हो चुके ये लग्न शुरू है अब हम चलते हैं मकर लग्न कब शुरू होगा वहाँ से देखेंगे मकर से आई नहीं ये तो दो घंटे ही बताएगा ना वो अगला कब शुरू हो रहा था इसकी ड्यूरेशन खत्म हो गई अपने आप इधर आ जाइए आप इसीलिए वो जरूरी है हाँ अब देखो हाफ डिग्री का तो वैसे अपने चलने में डिस्टेंस हो गया तो अपन ये जो मान रहे थे फोर एंड हाफ ये अपन फाइव मान लो अब हम लोग इस समय मकर राशि पे खड़े हैं इससे पहले हम धनु पे थे और जब हम वहाँ धनु राशि पे गए तो वहाँ हमने देखा कि शेड जो थी वो एक सौ पिचासी से पाँच डिग्री क्रॉस कर चुकी थी यानी पाँच डिग्री पहले धनु लग्न शुरू हुआ अब यहाँ पर हम देख रहे हैं ये शेड दो पे है और जब ये एक पे पहुंचेगी, तो मकर लग्न शुरू हो जाएगा वही हमें चाहिए आज एक अब इस समय ये शेड यहाँ है और ये नंबर 180 है इक्यासी बयासी तिरासी चौरासी पिचासी जब ये शेड यहाँ पहुंचेगी, तो ये पूरा 30 डिग्री का है डिग्री के बाद ये लग्न शुरू हो जाएगा समझ गए तो पाँच डिग्री वहाँ पूरी हो चुकी पच्चीस डिग्री के बाद ये शुरू हो रहा है तो ये पूरा तीस डिग्री रहा यानी धनु लग्न जो है वो पूरे दो घंटे रहेगा ठीक है लेकिन जब आप मकर लग्न को देखेंगे तो मकर लग्न की अवधि दो घंटे नहीं है ये जब यहाँ शेर पूरी होगी तो कुंभ पे जाएंगे समझ गया ये बिल्कुल तो जिस प्रकार हमने जयप्रकाश यंत्र में देखा राशियों की अवधि जो बताई है कि एक एक महीने में एक एक राशि बदल रही है लेकिन उनका डिस्टेंस बीच में जो है वो कम और ज़्यादा है इसी प्रकार इन राज लग्न में भी कोई लग्न बहुत लंबी अवधि का रहेगा और कोई लग्न दो घंटे से कम अवधि का रहेगा इसलिए ये अलग से बारह यंत्र बनाने की आवश्यकता पड़ी अदरवाइज इनकी आवश्यकता नहीं होती अगर ये सभी लग्न समाप्त होते तो जयप्रकाश यंत्र ही इसके लिए बिल्कुल ठीक था पर्याप्त था उसी से सब पता कर सकते थे कि अभी ये धनु लग्न चल रहा है दो घंटे बाद मकर लग्न हो जाएगा फिर कुंभ हो जाएगा चूंकि लग्न की अवधि इक्वल नहीं है इस वजह से अलग से ये यंत्र बनाए गए हैं तो वहाँ से हम ये देखें वर्तमान समय में कौन सा लग्न चल रहा है फिर यहाँ आके उस लग्न को देखें कितनी देर पहले शुरू हुआ और कितनी अवधि और रहेगा फिर दूसरा लग्न कब शुरू हो रहा है तो उन दोनों के बीच की निश्चित दूरी वो हम यहाँ निकाल लेते हैं ठीक है हाँ ये दोनों ही लिखे शुरू में जब इसको बनाया गया था तब ये अंग्रेजी नहीं थी ये देवनागरी में ही थे सारे नंबर और बाद में जब इसका 1901 में इसका रेस्टोरेशन हुआ तो उस समय फिर इसको अंग्रेजी भाषा में भी सारे नंबर डाल दिए गए उससे पहले ये अंग्रेजी में नहीं थे चलिए साहब ठीक है As you reflect on the genius behind the monumental efforts made 300 years ago, a profound mix of emotions washes you over. Witnessing the intricate designs crafted to decipher the universe's mysterious dance fills you with awe and humility. Just like the enchanting Kalbeliya dance of Rajasthan mirrors the nomadic spirit of the Kalbeliya tribe, it reflects not only Rajasthan's vibrant culture but perhaps also the mysterious rhythms of the universe. Just as the dancers roam and swirl, 
This ancient art form symbolizes our own journey as nomads in the cosmos, echoing and swirling motions of stars and cosmic energy, reminding us of our ever-changing place in the boundless expanse of the universe. For centuries, humanity has sought to understand the celestial laws that govern our existence, who we really are, or connecting us to something greater. For in every human, there is a sense that something infinite has been lost. As you prepare to bid goodbye to the beautifully golden land of Rajasthan, you feel overwhelmed by the weight of this legacy. Each sunset over the desert reminds you of the ancient quest for meaning, intertwining your journey with the timeless mysteries of the universe that define who you are.